pleasure to have her report from Carlos Platon things that came to us. And after this, if those of you who go to the March meeting, maybe a few of you will get to hear him talk about something I'm sure different. But again, Herbic did his PhD at Tubingen and he worked on ECs in micro traps. But before that, Maybe after that, no, before that, he did, uh, he did electron impact ionization of atoms, which I think is, which I think is why he used these electron uh, uh, quantum microscope techniques for, uh, for patterning uh, in, in VEC later when he joined Kaiserslautern. And, uh, but uh, as a postdoc, he spent time in in in, in, Gusio, in, in Gusio's group. In, in, Florence and uh, did a lot of fantastic work, but uh, since being in Kaiserslautern, he was used, to, as I said, ionization of atoms in rhetoric, uh, in BECs, sorry, rhetoric he did later, to, uh, to make, uh, to do uh, really very detailed uh, electron scanning of, of BEC, and then very recently he's gotten into the game of uh, rhetoric excitation in BEC, which we for us today. So, yeah, thank you, Rasing, for the introduction <coughs> and the invitation. It was a highly interesting day uh, today for me, and it will continue tomorrow, so I'm very happy to be here. And welcome, everybody. I guess, can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Sure. Um, yeah, so welcome, everybody. And um, I will tell you about uh, what happens if you try to combine the world of Rydberg physics with the world of what are called quantum gases. And, uh, Toward the end of my talk, I will uh, explain you how the title of this talk comes about, what butterfly molecules and what Einstein condensates uh, means. So the outline is that I first give you an introduction to ripper gases and ripper physics, why it's interesting to work with them. I will then introduce to you the experimental setup, and you will also want to learn a bit more about this electron microscopy technique that I'm pursuing now since uh, yeah, almost 10 years, actually. And then I will go through a sequence, a series of experiments with Rydberg atoms that we did. The first one is that we uh, created a very small sample of atoms, which we drive in the so-called superatom regime, and we are looking at the statistics of Rydberg excitations in such a small atomic sample. We then, I then move on to the subject of Rydberg molecules. We've already heard uh, what these are. I will briefly sum this up and we'll then explain you two experiments. The first one is how you can use the excitation to Rydberg molecules to grow online the superfluid to more insulator transition in a three-dimensional optical lattice. And in the uh, last and bigger part uh, of this talk, I will uh, explain you how you can create butterfly Rydberg molecules. Now, Rydberg atoms are great, and in many respects, the most important properties are that the transition dipole element scales with a main principle quantum number squared, so that leads to very strong interactions. The lifetime of the Rydberg atom is in the order of 20 to 50 microseconds, and if you're doing fast enough your experiments, well, shorter than that time, you can be, uh, you can observe coherent dynamics, but you might also be interested in maybe incoherent open system dynamics. Um, the interaction between two Rydberg atoms is long range and follows either a potential 1 over r cubed or 1 over r to the 6. This depends on the on the details of the interaction. And um, if you just consider a few Rydberg atoms, there is many interesting few body physics <laughs> that you can uh, study, for instance, by having two Rydberg atoms. People have done entangling, entanglement between the two atoms. Um, if you have more of them, you can generalize the idea of many body Rabi oscillations, oscillations, and people are now also trying to um, make quantum information processing with arrays of Rydberg atoms that you individually address, and you take always take advantage of the interaction between the atoms, so they can interact over distances of micrometers with each other. Now, the, the physics that fuels all these uh, experiments is the Rydberg blockade. So let me briefly explain to you what the Rydberg blockade means. So here is a three-level scheme where you have two atoms in the ground state. You have one atom 
uh, in the ground state, the other in the, uh, the Rydberg state, and you have both atoms in the Rydberg state. And these two atoms are separated by a distance r, and depending on this distance, the doubly excited state, so having both atoms in the Rydberg state, that shows, um, that shows uh, for instance, let's take here this repulsive interaction. Now there is the resonant excitation, shown in black, where you shine a laser that can exactly excite a single atom to a Rydberg state, you see that here, when the atoms are far away, you can excite the first atom, and then you can excite the second atom, no problem. But if they are close together, you can go to the first excited state, but you see that the second excited state, so having two Rydberg atoms in your system, is out of resonance. This is a blockade, so you are blocked in this state here, and actually this state, if you, if you write it down precisely, is an entangled state, because you don't know which of the Rydberg states has been excited. That is a Rydberg blockade, and it, ha it has been studied since uh, many years. But what is only recently, recently uh, coming up is the off sonet resonant excitation in blue. So again, we have the same level scheme. So two atoms repel each other when they are close enough. But now we have an off resonant coupling here in blue for blue detuning to the single atom Rydberg excitation. Now what can happen is that uh, the system shows the so-called anti-blockade. That means if your the first atom spontaneously or absorbs a photon and ends up in these uh, singly excited state, the second transition here in blue is resonant at a certain distance. So which means when you detune your laser, then you have the situation that a certain distance in your sample is favored, because at that distance you can excite two Rydberg atoms. And that leads to uh, strong consequences, which I will explain you uh, in, the, in the first setup. But these uh, kind of interaction that's at the heart of Rydberg physics and uh, uh, many experiments uh, rely on this. But now when you um, go to uh, what we call quantum gases, the world becomes more colorful. And especially uh, the time scales change. A Rydberg physics is very short scale. So it's, it's a few tens of microseconds lifetime. And in other called quantum gases, you have milliseconds or seconds of coherence time, or traffic time, whatever time scale you prefer. You typically study unitary dynamics, you ground states of Hamiltonians that you're interested in, and the interaction in cold gases is mainly the contact interaction. The two atoms really have to be on top of each other in order to see each other. In general, long-range interactions are challenging to implement. It's not impossible, and we have experts here in dipolar quantum gases that are, are going towards this direction, but in general, it's not an easy task. But Rydberg atoms exactly have this long-range interaction. And if you combine the two worlds, then you can, in my point of view, take advantage of two scenarios. The first one is you simply take a quantum gas with an Einstein condensate or a mod insulator as a resource for doing Rydberg physics on top. So just you exploit the density distribution or the properties of this quantum gas to do Rydberg. Uh, excitation, and for instance, you can imagine of having excitation transport between Rydberg atoms. You, uh, uh, in, in, in the Immanuel Bloch group, they have shown that on a, in a more insulator system, you can see crystallization of Rydberg excitations because they are all talking to each other. There are certain uh, yeah. mechanisms that leads to a quasi crystal in that case. You can look for spatial correlations. And uh, in general, as a Rydberg state, once you have excited, will always decay and spontaneously decay. You generically uh, enter the system uh, or the field of open system uh, quantum dynamics. But you can also try the other way around and say, can I take advantage of the long range interactions between two Rydberg atoms and modify the ground state interaction between two neutral atoms in my mod insulator? So is it possible to get long range interactions in a mod insulator by coupling the system to Rydberg? Uh, States, this is the field of Rydberg dressing, so you off resonantly couple to a Rydberg state, which means you admix a little bit epsilon of the properties of the Rydberg state to the ground state atom, and that can make two ground state atoms interact over long distances. This is the dream of our experiment. We are not yet there because the problem here are many inelastic collisions, but we are working on that. At the moment, we use condensates and hot insulators to uh, put uh, Rydberg physics on top. Now let me briefly introduce the setup because that is peculiar. So we have a big vacuum chamber and in the middle of the vacuum chamber we trap the atoms in a cross-dipole trap. That's standard. We use rubidium atoms. 
But then first we have these uh, strange looking rods here. This is nothing else than copper, and we use them for making the uh, magnetic field for the magneto-optical trap, but also to make electric fields in arbitrary directions. We just switch with relays between power, between current supplies and voltage supplies. Um, we have uh, the electron microscope on top. So here, you uh, from this axis, there's a focused electron, electron beams that emerges and intersects with the atoms in the cross cycle trap. And eventually, what is also very special here, that we have a UV laser uh, at 297 nanometers. We use this laser to drive single photon transitions in rubidium from the 5S to any high-lying P states. And the advantage here is that we, uh, we avoid any intermediate state. Now, briefly to the scanning electron microscope. So we have this focused electron beam that I've explained to you. It intersects a non-local micro <coughs> trap. We trap atoms there. And when you uh, intersect them, you have a certain probability for having electron impact ionization of the atoms. Once you create an ion, it immediately follows an electric field and goes into a detector. And from the clicks in the, the detector, you can reconstruct the image. And uh, the nice thing is that the spatial resolution is in the order of 100 nanometers. So it's given by the beam diameter of the electron beam. This is what we can reach with our system. It's sensitive to single atoms because we see uh, the signal of a single atom that is ionized. But um, the efficiency uh, is only in the order of 20%, which means that 80% of the atoms we just lose and they are not ionized. We cannot see them. It's a two-dimensional imaging. It's uh, working in situ, and actually I would say that this is the most interesting uh, uh, feature of all this technique. You can probe your quantum gas here while it's still evolving in time. So you don't have to stop all the quantum dynamics and doing, for instance, an absorption image after time of flight. So it continues the uh, lift. This is called this in vivo technique. And we can be also, uh, uh, I will show you an example, use it to manipulate and prepare certain density distributions that are then useful later on in an, in an experiment. In case of Rydberg atoms, the overall cross-section scales as the main principle quantum number to the power of 4. The ionization cross-section scales quadratically with n. So uh, in case you have a Rydberg atom here, this interaction is simply huge because the electron is loosely bound. We have not yet exploited this, but uh, we will do that in the future. Now, with this electron beam technique, you can shape and image quantum gas. And here's such, uh, just an, exa um, an example of a Bose-Einstein condensate loaded in a one-dimensional optical lattice. You see a fraction of the system. And with the electron beam, you can also engineer the density distribution by removing atoms here and here, because, I mean, that's working, of course, as well. And so you can uh, get nice control over the size of an atomic sample. Now, uh, because that is also unusual, I will spend some words on the single photon excitation scheme. So uh, we use a UV laser at 297 nanometers. It comes from a frequency double dye laser with 3 watts. And uh, the best uh, performance ever was 800 milliwatt. Now we are only working at 100 because the crystal degrades. Um, for the coupling that we get to the Rydberg state, it's the highest Rabi frequencies are in the order of one uh, megahertz. Here you see the, uh, the doubling uh, resonator. And here you can see the fluorescence of the UV light that turns it into blue. Now let's come to the, to the first part of the experiment. Uh, you can read it here in this publication. It's the creation, excitation, and ionization of a superatom. Now let me explain you what I mean with that. So suppose you have a sample of atoms and you're excited to Rydberg states. And if there is no blockade and no interaction, then all the excitations here are uncorrelated with each other. They individually pop up. Now, assume you have a certain probability for creating an ion out of these excitations. Then the ions that you create, they will also pop up uncorrelated. And there is no relative or, or uh, there is no correlation. Now, suppose you make now your sample smaller, or you make the Rydberg blockade indicated by the spheres active, then two excitations cannot be too close to each other, because when they are too close to each other, they are shifted out of resonance. And that's a state you cannot excite with your laser. That means that you all of a sudden have a certain distance that the Rydberg excitations have to, have to fulfill, and they start to get correlated. And that's the regime where in the Immanuel's group they have observed a cross-eye crystal. But now if you do more, and if you simply make 
the sample smaller than the blockade radius, then you have a system that is so small that it can only host one excitation at a time if you drive it with a laser frequency. And you expect strong correlations in the ion signal that pops up here. So in order to study this, we tailor the density distribution in the same way as I've explained to you to prepare samples, for instance, having 400 atoms with a size of the diameter here in the order of 5 micrometer, and a small sample that is we mainly study has a diameter of maybe 3 micrometer in all three directions and uh, contains about 150 atoms. And these dimensions of 3 micrometer, they are just for the P state at the edge where the blockade is active. So we, accept to, we expect to have to be able only to excite one excitation in this, uh, in this sample. Now the experiment goes as follows. So we prepare the sample in the ground state, and then we couple it to a state that is a symmetric superposition of all possibilities of having the Rydberg excitation at one of the atoms, but only to this state. Huh? The second state in an ideal world does not exist because it contains two Rydberg excitations, and that state is shifted out of resonance. Now, if we excite this state here, we first have a uh, resonantly, uh, uh, collectively enhanced Bromley frequency because many atoms can absorb that one, uh, that one ripper excitation. And once we are in this state, we have a not so small probability of having an ionization. This comes from the fact that we have the whole system in an optical dipole trap. There is a 10 watt jack laser focused down to 40 micrometer in which the sample of atom is located. And the ionization rate is actually larger than the decay rate of the Rydberg atoms, which means almost all Rydberg atoms are ionized with that rate here of uh, 50 kilohertz. So, and in that way, the ions that are produced here give us the statistics of the Rydberg excitations. Now, if we drive the system resonant where the blockade is active, then we see in the pair correlation function of the ions that we produce an anti-bunching. And that comes from the fact that, so here's the relative measure. So here's the relative time between having, uh, between seeing two ions in our ion detector, and here's the probability, and you see it goes down for small time differences. And uh, the reason is the sample is so small that you can hardly have more than one excitation at the same time in your sample. And if you Cannot have, if you have a reduced probability of having two excitations, you have a reduced probability to create two ions at the same time. And that's why we see the anti-munching here. The whole sample actually decays in time on a millisecond time scale. So in this time scale, we see, we see about a thousand of ions coming out of the system, but all of them are uh, anti-correlated with this amplitude. And even here at the end, they are still anti-correlated. So this process is dynamically active. And actually, the time scale here is also interesting because it tells you how fast the system recovers after the excitation, after the ionization of one atom. So it essentially gives you the excitation time scale when until the system is back to normal, which means that it has forgotten that there was an ionization. Now, you can also make your sample larger, as shown here. And if it becomes larger, more and more atoms fit into uh, my more excitations fit into the sample. We just do this by making this part of the lattice that I've shown you larger. And then you see that, if you look at that graph here, that the central, the anti-bunching amplitude, so it's 1 minus G2 of 0, drops with increasing uh, size. So this is the regime of anti-blockade. But there is more. You can also now do what I've uh, motivated to you with off resonant excitations. Now, Suppose you have a blurry tuned laser, as I explained to you, there are in principle two ways of exciting your system. The first one is a two photon tri transition that goes directly from GG to RR. This is, however, very unlikely because you have strong decoherence in the intermediate state. So the process that happens in the systems, if you have off resonant excitation, is the following. So for a long time, you don't have anything because your first excitation is out of resonance, but from time to time, you have an off resonant excitation. Once you have your excitation, you are in this state here, and then a second photon can immediately be absorbed, and you get the second excitation. So once you have your first Rydberg excitation in the sample, the second one can come on top, or even the third one. And that leads not to anti-bunching, that leads to bunching. 
And this is shown here in the inset. Here you see the bunching amplitude of the ions when you drive the system off resonantly. And what was an anti-bunching before is now a strong bunching with high values here after 60. And uh, you see that if you increase the detuning, this, um, this effect increases. So by just choosing the detuning, you can go from one regime um, to the other. Even more interesting is the, the dynamics of the excitation, because we are not doing field ionization, as many people do in the field of Rydberg physics, but we are doing, we are relying on the ions that are produced just by the like, body radiation, for instance, or the dipole trap laser. We get a continuous signal, which means that we can determine the lifetime of the G2 correlation function. And again, the decay, the temporal decay of a pair correlation function tells you how long it takes until the system goes back to equilibrium. Now, if we are very much detuned, so if this first excitation step is very rare, then the physics is the following. For a long time, nothing happens. Then there is one Rydberg <coughs> excitation which pops up. There is immediately the second one, but there is no time enough to, to get the third one. So then the whole system decays again, and uh, these, the correlations are gone. That's why the lifetime here is given by the, um, by the lifetime of the Rydberg state, which is this uh, straight line here. Now if you come closer to resonance, so the seed process, which gives you the first excitation and the subsequent so this, you have many more seeds compared to the, to the, to the second excitation step. Um, and in this regime, you can have decay of your Rydberg atom, but before you completely lose all the excitations of your system, you can again get another one. So the system goes up and down a ladder of excitations and has a longer lifetime in this ladder. And that's why the lifetime goes up here. Once you are on resonance, you have anti-munching, and then the time scale is given by uh, the probability of exciting the atom. So there's a rich physics here, and I should point out that this, the curve that you see here, for instance, the theory curve, and here this corridor for the experimental data that was provided by Michael Jung and uh, uh, Michael Fleischhauer in, in Kaiserslautern, who modeled the system on resonance with a, with a master equation in Lindblad form here, and off resonantly uh, with a classical rate model. And you see that you can capture and the physics of this system with this model. Now, when you um, say... Uh, so, is this, what is this time scale that you are working before? That one here? Yeah. That's the decay time of the pair correlation function. So how long the, the, the Ritter correlations live in the sample, independent of the... Of the Once you have a Rydberg atom, 
in your sample or even two, uh, they will not survive. So because the forces are strong. You are strong. No. The time scale increases. Yeah, because I um, mean these two when you have the two excitations then can, they can create a third one. So I mean one is going away, but while it's going away, there is still a certain there's always as long as the Rydberg excitation is within the cloud, there is always a finite amount of atoms resonant with the laser. And that's why it um, survives. And if you if you go to uh, to smaller detunings, the forces are less, right? Because the repulsion is less for smaller. Um, yes. Now, in the, in, the, in, the, in the next part, I will explain to you what happens if you now increase the system from a single small sample, where you can observe the bunching and the anti-bunching, to um, one insulator. And um, this is just work in progress, so, so I just show you one signal here. This is now a time scale of milliseconds, so we, we drive now a big system, also off resonantly with a laser for a certain time. And what you can see here are single trajectories of the ion signal. So here we switch on the laser, and this is the ion signal. And you see that from time to time there is a there is a single ion. This is this is shown here. But then from time to time you see a burst of ions. You see many excitations, many ions popping up from the system at the same time. There's just different trajectories. You see they are randomly spaced. But for instance, if you look at at such, a, such an ion peak, then you see that this effect of this facilitated excitation can really be tremendous. And here, for instance, we observe up to 100 ions that are created in a, on a very short time scale of about 100 microseconds, roughly. And the reason is that we have this now much bigger system. It's about 50,000 atoms. It's, it's a smaller one. It's 20,000 atoms, small insulator. So you see there are single, single uh, ions popping up from time to time. But once you have it, there is a certain probability that you get the second one. And then the excitation cascade starts to grow. And that leads to these ion bursts where you all of a sudden you have hundreds of excitations in your system. And that's the reason why dressing is so dif difficult, because you always run in these, in these uh, aggregate formation, as it is also, uh, also called. The pioneering work in this respect uh, was having a group of Matthias Weidemüller and Ennio Arimondo who first saw that there is this facilitated excitation when you are out of resonance. Excuse me. So, what's the role of the mock insulator here? Uh, here, the, the role of the mock insulator, uh, actually in the DC, doesn't look very different. Uh, the role is that we are doing these experiments. Uh, this one here with the uh, n equals 25, the main principal quantum number. And uh, we were hoping to see, and an the average interaction length corresponds roughly to the distance in the one insulator. That's why we wanted to see some effect of the finite of the coarse grain structure of the one insulator on the Wittberg dynamics. But it, it's, it's not that uh, uh, important for this experiment. Now let's come to the second part of the talk, that's Rydberg molecules. We have already heard what the basic idea is. Suppose you have a Rydberg atom, it contains a rubidium plus ion and an electron, so this is the classical picture of the electron. And somewhere within the electron wave function, you have a ground state atom. And there is now elastic scattering of the electron from the ground state atom. And um, there is first an S-wave scattering possible, between the electron and the ground state atom, and this is described by this uh, potential here. So it's a contact potential that is only active when the electron sits on top of the rubidium uh, ground state atom, and it has a scattering length that can be positive or negative, depends on the, on the, on the energy. And yeah, suppose it is, uh, the scattering length here is negative, what this results in is an attractive potential between the electron and the ground state atom. And here we have one guy that is highly responsible for all this uh, stuff here that I will uh, present you now and has uh, predicted all these uh, molecules first in this publication and its subsequent ones. Now, what is the effect of this? Let's have a look again at the interaction. If you just in perturbation theory, plug in this perturber potential uh, into the electronic uh, wave function of the Rydberg atom, then we end up with this expression here. So we get 
a potential for the ground state atom that depends on the electron density. Now, in the very first experiment on these Rydberg molecules, in the Rydberg, uh, of a Rydberg electron here, and this density leads, because the scattering length is negative, to an attractive potential for the ground state atom. And now, within this potential that comes from the electron density, you find bound states. And this is a very basic principle of uh, Rydberg molecules here. <coughs> now, we have studied Rydberg molecules for P-state, Rydberg P-states, here, I show you uh, a time of flight spectrum of Rydberg molecules. So here is the time axis. At time zero, we excite the molecules. And then we wait what's happening. There are, there are two things that can happen. The first one is, uh, well, there are many things that can happen. But the two, interesting for, the two interesting ones are for us. The first one ionizes uh, the electron. And then you end up. Uh, with a rubidium plus ion, because then just the rubidium plus remains, and that goes into your detector. That happens after this time here, that's this time. And the second process is that the Rydberg mole molecule makes an, 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 an internal decay and makes an associative ionization process. So the bronze atom comes close to the core, they form a molecular ion, and the electron takes the binding energy, and this is the signal that you can see here. And now if you start on resonance, you, you only excite uh, single atoms, but you also see molecules that come from collisions between ground state atoms and, and um, Rydberg atoms. But if you now increase the detuning on the red side, you see that you go through a sequence of molecules. And we have done very extensive spectroscopy covering the full spectrum from the, from the fine structure splitting of the 25p free half state in rubidium to the 25p one half state. And you see that all the way there are molecular states here. And here there is something which is maybe not a state, but for instance here there is one state here. And um, that tells you that it is possible to create Rydberg molecules, also here for such low-lying states and for p-states. And now in the first part, I will uh, use now these molecule formation to probe the superfluid to one insulator transition. We prepare in our lab now a, a mod insulator here, actually density profiles of the mod insulator uh, for different lattice heights taken with the electron beam technique, you see that we can follow the increase for the experts of the Thomas Fermi radius, or let's say the average size of the sample with the lattice height as and when we reach the critical point uh, for the insulator, we kind of the system stops growing. Uh, at the same time, because we can measure the wings of the atomic distribution very precisely, we can get the temperature of the system, and you see that once we wrap into the lattice the temperature decreases, so that just tells you that we can uh, nicely produce these two um, uh, many-body states. And now we uh, excite Rydberg molecules in the system. So if you have a free lattice and the atoms have to be arranged in the lattice, you can have doubly occupied sites, maybe empty sites, singly occupied sites, or triply occupied sites. If you want to create a molecule, because it's a contact interaction, Two atoms have to be close by, well, they have to be as close as the Rydberg wave function that you want to excite in order to be able to form a molecule. So by um, exciting molecules and measuring the number of molecules, you know how many sites are be occupied. And here I show you a Bose Einstein condensate with about 20,000 atoms. Again, this is the spectrum. Here, and you see some molecular lines popping up here because in the Bose Einstein condensate, you have uncorrelated atoms. You find every every distance that you need, and of course some of the distances perfectly fit to a molecule, and that's why you can produce a molecule. But now if you ramp up the lattice and you cross the phase transition and you, you, you go in the n equals 1, 1 insulator, that's why we have this small atom number, you see that they almost completely disappear, the molecules. Instead, when you increase the atom number and are in the 1 insulator state where you have a high occupation of the occupied state, you see that all the, the molecules uh, appear again. We also studied this on a quantitative basis by looking, by changing the atom number and looking at the number <coughs> of ions that we produce in time for a BC. We find a scaling that goes with n to the power of 7 half, and with this, this few line here, that comes from the scaling of the size of the BC in a pauric poly potential and equating what is the, the average density that you have. But in case of a more insulator, you see that you have to increase the atom number up to a certain critical atom number, and then they start to form molecules. 
the fact that the excitation is only active where we have the occupied occupied cycle, also seen in this graph here, where we study first a one insulator with an n equals 2 core, then we excite molecules in this system. And I've explained to you that molecules can decay through associative ionization. And in any case, we don't have many indications in the experiments that once you have a Rydberg excitation, which decays, that it goes back to the ground state. So we assume the principle that every Rydberg excitation leaves the system. And indeed, if we excite the molecules and make a scanning electron microscopy image of the system after having excited the molecules, we can subtract the two images and we see that the difference is here in the center. And this corresponds to, the, to roughly the size of the n equals two shell in the systems which we have exclusively addressed. So it's a nice diagnose for that. Sorry. Uh, so if you have triple occupied cell, yeah. this will sum up and be your state in the occupied cell? It depends. If you have three atoms at uh, the site, so in the talk before, um, we learned that uh, you can also have a Rydberg molecule that has a Rydberg excitation and two ground state atoms, or even three and four ground state atoms in the, uh, within the electron wave function. Then the binding energy just doubles or triples. So these kind of molecules are at, at a different, uh, different frequency that you can excite. And it's in principle possible to exclusively uh, uh, excite trimers. So you, with this technique, you could, is, you could also see the number of triply occupied sites. The problem here for the n equals 25 p state is that there is not much Frank Compton overlap with the trimer state. That's why it doesn't show up here. But if you choose another principal quantum number, um, this idea here can be extended to higher number of atoms. So this is a diagnosis which uh, uh, has been also done with other techniques, for instance, radio frequency spectroscopy. But one thing that is peculiar here, this is that the molecules that you create they are converted into ions continuously. So you get an online signal live in your experiment about what is that is proportional to the actual number of molecules. And here we compare the number of molecules in a static setting, that's the points, and the dynamical setting where we simply uh, change within a few tens of milliseconds uh, at a lattice height and record the number of ions. And they fall both for two different atom numbers that fall on top of each other he tells you that indeed this is a way of online probing uh, the double side, uh, the occupancy of double sides. And you might, we have not yet done this, but you might use this technique, for instance, to study uh, the formation dynamics of double occupied sites with high precision, high temporal precision, for instance, after a quantum branch uh, from one side so, to the other. So is the idea simply to just have one way, one atom per lattice side, to just avoid this? Yes, exactly. That's it. That's a, it's a very simple idea, but it, but it nicely works. And it can be extended, for instance, to triply occupied sites for the right uh, for the right side. Now let's come to the last part, and uh, this is where the time will come from. So we again start with a with the Einstein condensate, and we now excite again molecules. So everything is the same. The only thing experimentally, the only different thing is that we now increase the detuning. So we really uh, go to extreme detuning and look where is a molecule. And there, another interaction becomes important, and that is that you do not only have an S-wave scattering between the electron and the perturber atom, but you also have a P-wave scattering between the electron and the perturber atom. And the P-wave scattering now has two consequences. So the first one uh, is it also has a, a scattering length that enters. It is, they have to sit on top of each other. But now here, the operator that was derived here is now the gradient of the wave function. Because a P wave has, 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 has zero probability of being exactly on the perturber, the interaction is sensitive on the gradient of the wave function and not at the amount of the wave function. So which tells you that the stronger the gradient of the electron wave function at the position of the ground state atom is, the stronger is um, the interaction. The second one is that this scattering length undergoes a so-called shape resonance that comes from the fact that uh, for alkalis there is a, a quasi-bound state uh, uh, for um, behind the centrifugal barrier. So which means that if the electron has the right energy, 
it, it goes onto the ground state atom and a perturbed atom, then it is trapped for a while in a resonant way, and then it escapes again. So the interaction is very much enhanced due to this shape resonance. And that has, uh, the result is that this interaction can have extreme values. Now, in perturbation theory, again, if you just look uh, uh, what is the expectation value of this operator for a given wave function, you see that, again, the interaction has a prefactor that comes from the scattering length, but now it is sensitive to the gradient of the wave function. So the interaction is strong when the gradient is large. Now, in order to now calculate the potential energy curves for our problem, we have to diagonalize the full problem. So let me briefly point out what the full quantum problem is. If you have a Rydberg atom with a ground state atom, and it's not even the full problem, but the one that is relevant for us. So first, you have the atomic Hamiltonian. That's the excitation of one atom to the Rydberg state. And it includes, for instance, the fine structure. Then you have the S-wave scattering. Amplitudes here. This is uh, there is even a, there is a distinction between having a singlet or triplet scattering. Singlet and triplet refers to the state of the two electrons, so the Rydberg electron and the electron that sits in the 5s state of the ground state atom. It can be singlet or triplet state. That's and these are the projectors on the singlet and triplet state. And there is this contact interaction. And then uh, what comes through the P wave is again you have two contributions, singlet, triplet, and the triplet one makes a shape resonance. And it has this gradient here that acts to the right and to the left of the two wave functions from which you want to know the matrix element. And important for one experiment <coughs> is that in the neutral and the ground state atom and the perturbed atom, you also have the hyperfine interaction between the state of the electron and the nuclear spin. Now, if you diagonalize this, we calculate this uh, uh, spectrum here. Let me briefly explain this to you. Here you see the asymptotic states of, uh, of rubidium, 87 Rydberg states. So this is a, the 25p state. For instance, you see different states because there is a fine structure splitting and the two hyperfine states for the second atom. There is the 24d state sitting on top. There is the 26s state. And here this is what one calls the hydrogenic manifold. You know in, in, in alkali atoms, if you look at the, at the Rydberg states, the SP and D states, they have quantum defects, so they are lowered in energy. That's why here you have 20, 25 P states, which belongs to a hydrogenic manifold that is way above here. So this is 23 here. And the, but once you are in the F state or higher L states, they have the same energy. They are degenerate, but that's the meaning of this hydrogenic manifold. And now there are two interactions, which have been again pointed out here by Hossein. Um, let's first consider the, the S-wave interaction. The S-wave interaction tries to maximize the electron density at the position of the perturber. Now, if you start from the hydrogenic manifold, you have many, many electron wave functions available that have the same energy, and you can try to combine them in a way that they maximize the electron density at the position of the perturber. And that is our, then these potential curves here that go down and then go up again, they come from the triplet scattering here, and the reason why they go up again is that the, the, uh, the, the, the scattering length changes uh, the sign. And because the, the atom is collecting as much electron as it can at the position of the perturber atom, here in the electron density that you can see here, uh, you see this peak here, and the overall shape of the electron density resembles that of the animal trilobite here. So here, uh, here is the z-axis in this direction, and this is the, the radial uh, uh, electron density plotted here at this axis. And uh, the rubidium plus belonging to the Rydberg atom sits in the center, and the ground state atom sits exactly here at this position. Now there is the second type of interaction, which maximizes the gradient of the wave function. Again, you now assemble all the, you look for all the electron wave functions, and uh, you try to maximize the gradient, and then you find a potential energy curve that follows this shape here. And uh, they are called butterfly states and have an electron density which resembles the shape of a butterfly. And it looks quite different from that one. And the reason is that you maximize the gradient here and not the, uh, and not the density. And that's where all the electronic wave functions completely interfere in a different way, coming up to uh, summing up to dense electron densities like this here. And because there is this shape resonance, this is a huge effect which 
which leads to binding energies of several hundreds of gigahertz. Now we are in the experiment doing Rydberg molecules with a 25p state. And all what I've shown so far is within that part of the wave function. Here you can see there is a little dip. But I mean, this is 100 gigahertz scale. So this dip is already enough to support some molecular states. I've already shown you a spectrum of that. But now you see that if you, if you go further inwards, this 25p state crosses with this butterfly state and leading to this red potential curve. And this red potential curve is the one that we are now examining. It has binding energies of tens of gigahertz. It oscillates here because it's a coupling of the butterfly state, which comes from here, with the 25p Rydberg state. And that's the reason why we can excite them, because the butterfly state normally comes from the hydrogenic manifold here, which does not include any p state. So which means there is no way of electronically exciting the electron in this state. But because they come so close to the 25p state, you have a, mix, a mixture of about 15% in this case. And that's uh, the reason why we can uh, excite them. Here is just with a color code 
the ion signal that we get, and you see when we go down in, in frequency by tens of gigahertz, we see a whole lot of resonances here, all coming from bound states in this potential here. And you see that when the calculated potential here reaches the minimum, also we lose track of the molecules. We do not see molecules anymore. Um, you see that also the density of molecular states that we see gets lower and lower with detuning, which is uh, compatible with the idea that in these individual potential wells, you have really localized, put, uh, localized molecular wave functions. That's what's indicated here in red, green, and blue. And uh, these localized wave functions really live in one well. There is almost no tunneling to the neighboring wells because the wells are uh, uh, so deep. So this is the, 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 the spectroscopic signature of seeing Rydberg molecules. You see here some points. I will come back to that uh, in a minute. Let me point out that our butterfly molecules look like that. Maybe the, there's a little bit more away from what a butterfly looks like. But that's a calculated wave function for one of those nodes. And the work that I'm presenting now is done in collaboration with the screen and the various reals, from which unfortunately I could not organize an image so far. Um, that is actually a butterfly state here, which comes from the black line here that has no oscillations. This black line here has no admixture of p-state. That's why we cannot excite it in the experiment. But it's, it's a state that does not maximize the gradient in the, along the direction of the internuclear distance, but the gradient in the, in the transverse direction. And that's why here the electron wave function is kind of moved to the back. Yeah, quite a funny, a funny wave function it looks like, maybe with Microwave transitions we are considering uh, if we might uh, want to excite these molecules as well. So the electron wave function looks like that. Now, let me put these molecules in an electric field. These molecules have a, an electric dipole moment. And this electric dipole moment comes from the fact that the ground state atom attracts or modifies the electron wave function. And for instance, in S-wave scattering, it really gets, takes the electron and pushes the center of mass towards this perturber atom. And the result is a permanent electric dipole moment, even though it's a homonuclear molecule. But the point is that the exchange energy is zero, essentially, because the two rubidium atoms cannot, cannot exchange their role. So there is a dipole moment in molecules that have been studied already. And also these butterfly molecules have a dipole moment. So because the electron wave function is kind of modified, so when you put them into an electric field, you can measure the dipole moment. And this is the spectroscopic result. This is the laser detuning for one of the for one uh, potential, uh, for one uh, state. And here is the electric field. And you see that we immediately see a splitting of the molecular states in the electric field that uh, uh, can be followed here seen in the experiment. Uh, here for zero electric field, we actually see the rotational states of the molecule, because when you are in zero field, the only degree of freedom the molecule has are the rotations. But to, in order to describe the full system, we uh, model this with an, uh, a rigid uh, rotator here with a principal quantum, with a quantum number n and a rotational constant b plus an electric dipole uh, in an electric field f. Now, the rotational constant is given by h bar p times over the momentum of inertia. And the momentum of inertia is now a way to extract the bond length of the molecule, because it depends if it's like that, or like that, or like that. So the rotational constant is different. And now what you see here as lines is a theoretical best fit to the experimental data. And you see that it nicely fits, and it resolves all the level structure here. And uh, what you can actually see here is the shape of the wave function of the molecule, of the, of the, the angular uh, shape of the wave function of the molecule, which looks rather funny here. The importance here is that these molecules are now really uh, aligned in the electric field. And you can, by going, by just choosing the right frequency, you can precisely set which kind of orientation you want to have <laughs> maximally oriented along the electric field, which is this one, or anything else in between. And you see there's even a substructure here because there is, we can excite the magnetic quantum number m equals 1 and m equals 0. So we start from a condensate where all the quantum numbers are 0. There is no angular momentum of the, in the initial state. And with a single photon, 
excitation, we can only cover to zero and one. And these are the states that you can see here and here. So another nice thing is here that you can extract from this spectrum two things. So first, you get the bond length of the molecule. And second, you get the dipole moment. Now, coming back first to the bond length. So this is again the spectrum that I've shown you. This is the intermolecular distance. This is the energy. And uh, if you just do spectroscopy, you can only get the position of the bound states. All right, so you can just draw a line here and say, here is my state. But now, because you can measure the rotational constant, you can also measure the bond length, which means you get a point here. And the points that you show here are experimental data points where we combine the bond length that we measure with, uh, 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 the, with the binding energy. And here you can see that the bond length that we find really nicely fit into the minima of this protection. Mm -hmm. And the experimental error that we have is as large at this point here. So it's a surprisingly precise way of measuring the bond length. So we can put points here and we pinpoint down this uh, potential here. And in addition, I've told you that the, this P-wave scattering, which leads to this potential, maximizes the gradient. Now, what is the way of maximizing the gradient? What is the best possible way of doing that? Well, you take as much 25 P-wave function as you can. Because the 25 P-wave function is the one that has the highest number of nodes. And that's why it has the steepest gradient in the field. If you go to a very high L state, then nothing happens. So the minima of this potential here are directly related to the zero crossings of the 25 P wave function. And this is shown here on top. This is the 25 P wave function of the electron. And what is shown here is the position of the bond length of the butterfly molecules that you observe. And you can see whenever the 25 P wave function Cross is zero, there is a minimum in the potential, and that's why we find a molecule there. So you can see this in some uh, loose and uh, some clear sense that the molecules, you can set the bond length by just choosing the right state. And here, this is a funny way of doing electron wave function microscopy, because you can detect the zero crossings of the wave function with this thing. Now let me close this seminar with the electric dipole moment of the butterfly states. So here again, you see the electron wave function of the state we are injected. Here we make a zoom into the, sorry, so into, into this plane here where I show you in red the position of the rubidium plus uh, atom and in green the position of the, of the neutral perturber. And what you can see is that the electron here is much larger, and that refers now to your question, Francesca, than the, than the, than the, the distance between the two. Uh, uh, between atoms. And you see that they are spread all over here, the electron. Now, just from the measurement, we extract values in the order of 300 to 500 dBi as a dipole moment of these molecules. And this is close to the record, which uh, also Hosselgin was involved in, that was found in cesium atoms for a different class of molecules, even exceeding 1,000 dBi. But what is really interesting here is that in for one state, and this state is exactly that one here, the closest one, we find the following combination of electric dipole moment and bond length. The electric dipole moment is 150 times the electric charge times A0, and the bond length is 116 times A0, which means this is a molecule where the charge separation is larger than the separation of the two constituents of the molecules. In other words, you have your rubidium class here, you have the neutral rubidium here, and the center of mass of the electron. I mean, the electron is everywhere, as you can see here. But because you have these strong interference peaks here, the center of mass of the electron is even outside the internuclear axis. And in case of the theta butterflies, you even expect the electron to be on the other side here. So this is an interference effect, but uh, it's a nice one, and um, we are still thinking, but we don't think that this happens in any other molecule that you have such a gigantic uh, charge separation. Okay, that brings me now to the end of my talk. Um, there is a lot to do now, especially on the Rydberg molecule uh, sides. Um, one thing that I have uh, uh, hidden so far is the fact that the 
coupling strength to the butterfly molecule is extremely weak because they are so small. They are only five nanometer apart from each other, the two constituents. So what we would we'll try to do in the future is to start from weakly bound Feschbach molecules, which have a similar Then we have a system starting from an N equals 2 mon insulator where we have molecules in a lattice with a strong dipole moment that can uh, truly long range interactions uh, show long range interactions, maybe to study spin systems or even in terms of recurrent dressing, uh, trying to have bronze state molecules with modified properties because they are coupled to a recurrent state. But that is, uh, that is in the future, but we will work on that here. And there is a lot more one can do with the molecules. For instance, the internal decay is quite, quite uh, complex. And one thing uh, that might be for the experts, uh, an outlook here is uh, you can create heavy Rydberg systems. A heavy Rydberg system is a system that is a system which, which consists of an ion of a positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion, which are in a, in a Rydberg state. Now here we have a positively charged ion, and we have this ground state atom, which has a high concentration of electron density around the ground state atom. Now, in, uh, in rubidium, to have rubidium minus, it has to be a singlet state. That's the only, that's not the, the property of the rubidium minus state. And the shape resonance is in a, in a triplet state. But uh, because there is the hyperfine interaction, the butterfly molecule is a mixture of singlet and triplet states. So it can be that butterfly molecules are a starting point to attach the electron to the ground state uh, atom and then really having a heavy Rydberg system. Maybe that works. And uh, apart from that, we, of course, continue our quest for dissipated Rydberg gases and see in all these cluster dynamics and learning more about the strong correlations that you have when you inside your system to Rydberg atoms. That's it. Let me thank uh, uh, the team, uh, most notably Thomas Niederblum, who, who, who really did all the butterfly work and is uh, hard working. Uh, uh, Tobias Weber was mainly in charge with a, with a super atom. Oliver Thomas is a new PhD student. Uh, Toss here worked on the, uh, on the, on the lattice uh, a diagnosis with Rydberg molecules. And uh, yeah, these are new members of the team. And with that, I thank you for your attention. What is a uh, hydrodynamic state? You said 25 hydrodynamic. What does that mean? Hydrodynamic uh, manifold, the 23. Mm -hmm. So that's the collection of all high angular momentum states. Yep. So how do you excite something like that? Um, no, we do not excite them. We can only excite a 25p state. Yes. We can only excite this state here. This state we cannot excite, but we can excite the state here when it goes down and mixes with a 25p state. Was that your question? How do you get it? You, you're producing it and then pulling it up to get no. it in a, in, a, in a, For instance, in a condensate, you have two ground state atoms sitting at arbitrary locations. Yes. And if you find two atoms which sit at a, at a, at a distance of, let's say, here is 200 A0, yes. then you can excite them, or you can photo associate them from the free state into this bound state. So, so, so you do not go kind of from there to there. You somehow go from just two ground state atoms directly into the state here. You make no transition between molecules. You associate from the continuum from two free, free atoms.
to mention, maybe that a little bit was that in the compact interaction, I did have a P with a Yeah, you have the two scattering channels. Yes. S and P wave. Yes. And now you have this, uh, this P wave admixture in the interaction itself. And now the question is, do you see any effect of the anisotropy of this P wave admixture with respect to the S wave? I would say an effect of the anisotropy is the fact that you have these two kinds of uh, molecules. Okay. The ones which maximize the gradient in all directions and the ones that maximize the gradient in theta directions. Because you have a principle around the perturbator and free potential symmetries, or you can put your P wave electron 